to the gig, and we were in the backup band, and it was I think it was live radio. Well, yeah, we were we pre we taped all that yeah. and, and then ran it on on a program later on, but yeah. Uh, what a talented young lad he was too, huh? Absolutely, he still is actually. Uh, you, you were uh, you were part of uh, the Gemini Awards the other night. See, look at the way these threads tie in. We had Helga Stephenson with us, who's uh, you know she was a big part of the Canadian film and uh, television industry, and we're talking about the Gemini Awards, and you you were on one of them. Yeah, um, it was just a couple of nights ago, and um, I was lucky enough to have a big band. I mean, when when do you ever get a big band? You know, mm -hmm. nine horns, four rhythm. We had thirteen piece with. Two singers. We had Kelly Lee Evans and Deborah Cox singing, and uh, it was like a swinging buble style big band. It was great. It was really a lot of fun. Yeah, I sort of miss those days. Uh, well, that's sort of. I mean, I miss. I love big bands. Yeah. I, mean, I love. Used to go watch the Boss Brass all the time, and it's just there's there's nothing like uh, when those horns start blaring, and you know, it's just a uh, wow. That's why it's so important when artists like Michael Bublé and Diana Krall and Natalie Cole and all that stuff keep that music alive because believe it or not there's an infrastructure of extremely talented guys in Los Angeles and New York and Toronto that know how to make that music but without the Krall's and the Bublé's and the Coles they never get a chance to do it you know yeah and you did the the orchestration for the horns and strings for uh, Bublé right yeah on his last record the haven't met you yet and all of that stuff yeah i think i've heard that song a couple times <laughs> <laughs> on my way in. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, what's it like uh, working with him? I met him very briefly years ago. Uh, I did an interview with him. And he seems like an awful nice guy. Do you know what? I met him in uh, 2007. Uh, I was director of the uh, musical director of the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame, and we were fetting Joni Mitchell. And he was one of the guys that was brought in to sing to Joni and stuff like that, and we really hit it off. And he is a sweet, sweet guy. I mean, here's a guy on top of the world. I, I'm, yeah, I, I mean, his last record sold six million copies. Lady Gaga's last record did not sell six million copies, and it's funny how how Gaga would get the media and Buble wouldn't. But I mean, well, he's that's a sweet Buble's, guy. Buble's got to wear a suit made of meat, <laughs> <laughs> or maybe he could do it out of out of fish for all the uh, for all the vegetarians. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Mike, nice suit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I know what you're saying. Well, I, I, we had uh, Ian Thomas on a number of months ago, and he was talking about... Who how, I used to play with many, many years ago. What a wonderful, wonderful man. Yeah. What, a, what a funny man, too. He is. Uh, you know, he said, he said, nowadays, he says you can't... No, nobody wants to see it unless you come on dressed as, like, a, a flower or with meat or whatever. That's right. <laughs> you know, like, he was talking about, was it Pink or somebody there a couple of years ago? Who was that? Uh, you, hanging upside down on a trapeze at uh, yeah. the Grammys? Yeah. Yeah. And the, who came out in the in the egg? Was that Gaga? Was it, that, was lady, that was Lady Gaga? It must have been. And, and who wore that really disgusting outfit a number of years ago? A big uh, floral kind of chiffon thing. You remember that? I don't. All right. Maybe it was a bad batch that night. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was on fashion TV. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> Where, what are your beginnings, for musical beginnings? How did you, you find yourself into this... Uh, a, extremely uh, satisfying career. Uh, there was no musicians in my family at all. I just kind of uh, gravitated towards it, and um, um, I started as a player. And uh, I was just scrabbling around, you, you know, just like everybody else. But in 1980, David Clayton Thomas called me from Caracas and said, "Would you like to join Blood, Sweat, and Tears?" And uh, I said, "Let me think about it." <laughs> yeah, sure. So I, I left the Charlottetown Theater Festival where I was playing like stage two rehearsal piano. You know, not that there's anything wrong with the Charlottetown no, Theater no, Festival, but uh, I got on a plane and met them and off we went around the world a few times. I was 22 and things kind of changed from that moment on and doors opened, you know. Yeah, I guess we had uh, two or three of the guys from Lighthouse on one day and we were trying to figure out who came first, Lighthouse or Chicago. And he said, well, actually the order is Blood, Sweat and Tears That's first. Right. Then Lighthouse second, and then Chicago. That's right, because the, fusion the very cool. first Blood, Sweat, and Tears record was 68, so it just predated all of those guys. Mm -hmm. yeah. And how long were you with Blood, Sweat, and Tears? I was with Blood, Sweat, and Tears for three years, and then I joined up with Clayton five years later uh, for a little bit, and then a couple of years ago, uh, Clayton moved back to Toronto and to play with him again, but uh, I just produced and arranged his latest record for U Universal called mm -hmm. Soul Ballads. Cool.